Welcome everybody. We are so glad to have you with us today for a virtual meeting with one of our scientists. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rachel and I work with the education team at the Natural History Museum. Today, we're meeting with a special guest from our research and collections department. The Natural History Museum is home to over 35 million objects and specimens. Our scientists use these collections to conduct research about our natural and cultural worlds, past and present. Each scientist has a special area of focus for their research, but together they're helping to build the history of life on our planet. Today, we're going to meet with Dr. Jan Vendetti, Associate Curator of Malacology. Malacology is the study of mollusks. Dr. Vendetti, our resident snail specialist, is going to give us a glimpse into the wonderful world of mollusks. From our gardens to the sea, we'll learn a little more about Jan's research and how this extremely diverse group of organisms has adapted its use of slime for different environments. So I'm gonna sh stop sharing my screen so we can meet our presenter today and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hi, Dr. Vendetti. Hi, Rachel. Thanks everybody for being here. I'm gonna share my screen so you all can see some of what I study and uh, so I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Dr. Jan Vendetti. I'm the Associate Curator in Malacology, and I'm going to talk to you about snails, slugs, and slime. Um, to start off, uh, mollusks, this is the group that I study. It's called a phylum, if you're familiar with that. It means a big branch of the tree of life. And there are over 100,000 species of mollusks. That's um, a lot. There are about 5,000 species of mammals, just for comparison. So if you think of every mammal, that you can possibly imagine from mice to whales to us, there are about 5,000 of those. Mollusks, which you might be less familiar with, there are 100,000. So there are lots and lots of species and this is called um, uh, high biodiversity, which I'll talk about in just a bit. Um, but to get us off on the right foot, so we are all on the same page with what this group um, consists of, like I said, malacology is the study of mollusks. Let's go through quickly just some of the big groups within mollusks, right? So I said mollusks are a phylum, this big branch of the tree of life. But then if you imagine that tree, excuse me, that branch broken up into smaller branches, I'm just going to go through a few of those groups, so which you may be more familiar with. And... The first of those are the bivalves. So these are clams, oysters, um, things like that. Things that have two valves. That's why it's called bivalve, two valve, two shells. So two shells. The next group are chitons. This is a, a more um, unusual and less familiar group to most people. Chitons have a series of plates. They live only in the ocean and they don't live in fresh water or on land and they stick to the rocks. So if you live close to an ocean um, and you go out on the rocks, maybe at very low tide, you'll be able to see these, these strange sort of armor. They almost look like um, roly polies, but they're maybe about that big. And they stick to the rocks and you hardly ever see them moving. If you're extremely patient, you might see them. But this is a diverse group. Very few people um, on earth study them, but they're super, super interesting. They're called chitons. The next group you might be familiar with within the mall these are the cephalopods. So these are uh, the nautilus, which is this coiled, shelled, um, squid-like animal, and then squid and octopus. These are really intelligent compared to other invertebrates, things without backbones. Um, very strange, very understudied. So that just means that there is a lot more to know about these animals than we currently know, which is really interesting and fun for scientists. So science is never done. We have lots more to do. And then the group that I study are called the gastropods. These are snails and slugs. So here's just a few examples of different snails and slugs that we'll get into just a bit. Um, marine snails within that group of all of snails or all of the gastropods, there are about 40,000 species of just marine snails. That means ocean living snails. Um, and if you're looking at the, the picture on the screen right now, this is Caledia caledii. That's its scientific name. It has this purplish, um, grayish, sometimes slightly green shell. Um, and then this is its foot, this um, black and yellow with white dots. Um, that's its foot. And what's interesting about gastropods with shells is they can stick their foot out 
and crawl around. And I think you're going to know what I'm going to say. What's on the bottom of their foot is slime and they slime along and then they can pull their foot in. So they have like a house on their back um, and they make that house. So there's no way for a snail to leave their shell and then come back in or find a new shell. Hermit crabs do that, but hermit crabs are a different group of animals. Snails um, are like turtles. They make their shell and there's no way for them to leave that shell without dying. So these are marine snails. Um, I couldn't help but add this photo. This is a, a, a giant sea slug called a, sea, a black sea hare. It's called um, a Plesia vicaria. And it's found on the Southern California coast. So those of you who are in Southern California, um, you live adjacent to the very largest sea slug of them all in the entire world. And it really is as big as it looks. I mean, sometimes they are, they are so you can see me in the camera, this big which is huge. Um, so these are tremendous, amazing sea slugs. They're only marine, just as an example. Then terrestrial mollusks, that means land living snails. They're about 40,000 species. So lots and lots of these. This friend is a species that lives in Southern California. Um, its scientific name is Helminthoglypta tediculata, which is a big name for a small snail. Um, this is a really awesome slug that has um, no shell and lives in Australia, but I'm adding it because it's pink and amazing. And what I wanted to um, remind you of here is that um, snails have shells, slugs don't, but they're very closely related. And it's not that slugs left their shell one day and went sliming along, it's that through evolutionary history, the shell of a slug became smaller and smaller over time. And then if you think about this, and I'll get to this in just a bit, there's something special that then happens to a slug's body that's often different from a snail. So a snail for protection, it can pull itself. Remember I mentioned they can put their foot out and their head, this is their head right here. They can put their foot in their head and a lot of their body outside of their shell. But when they need to defend themselves from something, say trying to eat them, they can pull themselves inside their shell. But a slug can't do that. A slug can't pull itself into, inside any shell because it doesn't have one. So now just keep that in mind and remember this charismatic, um, weird and amazing, crazy pink slug. And I'm gonna ask you some questions about it later. So one of the things that um, people like myself at the museum, um, people who are uh, biologists study often is what we call biodiversity. And that's the variety of species in an environment. So I'm showing here um, a picture of sea slugs because they're so amazing. So these are ocean living uh, gastropods, sea slugs, four different species. Here is one species, this is called Thuridilla picta, that's a scientific name. It's a, a beautiful sea slug. It's very, very tiny, but it is uh, exquisitely beautiful, I would say. And I wanna show you this depiction just so you kind of get a sense of what biodiversity means. In this picture, there are six Thuridilla picta. And although they are awesome and amazing, this is showing what we would call low biodiversity. If everything is the same, um, the word for that is homogenous. If everything is the same, all the species are the same species, you have low biodiversity. Uh, in contrast, if you have six different species, or in this case, five different species, these two are the same, five different species in one location, that is high biodiversity. So something being biodiverse, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of one species, but one thing that we study as scientists is a lot of different species within groups, right? And that's what's important about saving and conserving wildlife is that it's not just one species, it's many, many species. And we have some estimates um, uh, project that there are nearly 8 million species of animals on earth um, and around maybe one and a half to 3 million of those have been described. So that leaves us at least 5 million species on earth to discover and describe, which is quite amazing. So who studies all this biodiversity? Well, I introduced myself. You know that people like me, biologists study this biodiversity. Also paleontologists, paleontologists study biodiversity that has gone extinct or is in the fossil record. So um, millions of years ago. And to just give you kind of a sense of what, um, what scientists are like, or people like me, do you have to be um, an absolutely uh, completely brilliant person? 
Um, I'd like to think that we're all brilliant in our own ways, but you can be a totally normal, um, interested person and be a scientist. And the important characteristics that you have to have are curiosity. And I think everybody has that. Every child has that. Um, I hope that you don't lose it wherever you are in school, that you find something to be curious about, whatever it is. But scientists all have that, um, have that characteristic because they're, like I said earlier, there is always something to learn. Um, you also have, an, have to have an interest to be a biologist or a paleontologist in fossils or living things. So this is a, um, a, an artist's depiction of what an ammonite um, may have looked like swimming. So this is an ancient and extinct cephalopod that would have swam um, with its squiddy body like this in a coiled shell. So this group of mollusks is completely extinct, but we have paleontologists who are creative and um, do field work and discover these species and um, having an interest in these obviously is a prerequisite for being a biologist or paleontologist. Um, of course, you'd have to like to learn new things, which I hope we all do and like to ask questions. And those questions don't have to be something that you figure out on your own. Those are some things that you can collaborate with other people to ask. So for example, some people who ask questions about um, uh, the ammonites in this picture, they had to collaborate with people who studied biomechanics, which is the, the study of how things move and how water flows around objects. And they, had they those biologists um, collaborated with people who studied biomechanics to figure out how these things likely um, lived, which is a really fun part of paleontology. Okay, and then finally, enjoy exploration. So here I'm showing um, a scuba diver who is um, who is exploring some biodiversity on a, a pier piling, but I cannot scuba dive. I am a biologist by training and I study marine organisms. I can snorkel, but I can't scuba dive and I never learned. But that does not mean I cannot do what I do. Um, and a lot of mollusks are land living. So I study a lot of them. And I, lot, I study a lot of the organisms that are in our collections, um, which is one of the really fantastic parts about being at a museum is that I have a library of biodiversity where I work. So you can enjoy um, exploring, um, scuba diving, or this is Griffith Park, just taking walks or hikes around the, the region that we live in or wherever it is that you live, exploring outdoors. And then also something that I did a lot as a kid is exploring through books. So if you don't have that biodiversity at your doorstep or in some place that's easily accessible for you, you can access and learn about that biodiversity from guidebooks. And um, these are really, it's, it's like opening a page, a whole book of fantastic biodiversity, which is really um, uh, just a tremendous experience. So your biodiversity, uh, the place that you study biodiversity might be the library. Okay, so now I'm going to segue into slime. So I started off with this picture. This is a slug. This is a slug from Southern California. It's called, its scientific name is Deroceris lavy, and it's probably about this big. And there's a little aphid stuck over here in this shiny stuff that's coming off of the animal. That is its slime. So snails and slugs make slime. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I imagine, um, depending on how old you are, that you are somewhat familiar with the properties of slime, right? So, pardon me, making slime at home for a couple of years has been like the cool, fun thing to do. There are YouTube videos that have millions and millions of views, which you all probably know. And if you've made slime, or if you haven't, you can just deduce from these photos, right? Slime can be sticky and it um, flows, right? It's obviously not a solid, but it's not a complete liquid either. And it's um, oozy and it's slimy. And what's interesting molecularly about that is that slime is not a liquid, like I just said, or a solid that the molecules in slime move past each other in a way that is referred to by people who study this as a liquid crystal. So these little, little white bits that look like little grains of rice are supposed to be showing you how those molecules line up in a liquid and a solid. And a liquid crystal, they flow by each other. So that is one of the, the capacities of slime is to be slimy, right? To be slick and to be able to move past um, uh, and stretch. 
so how have um, humans used slime? I'll get into how snails and slugs use slime in just a minute, but let's start off with how do we as humans use slime? And here are some slime trails. These are um, the, sl the snails that I was talking about earlier. Their scientific name is Helminthoglypta tediculata. They're from Southern California and they're making little slime trails and they're doing something. Looks like they're maybe following some slime trails of other snails. And what are some things that people have done with slime? Um, really amazingly, somewhat recently, Slug slime has inspired scientists to invent a new kind of surgical glue. So if you've ever gotten stitches, um, there are other ways that you, instead of having stitches sewn into a person to keep a, a wound closed, there, in some cases, it would be much quicker and better for the wound and for the person to just have a sticky substance that they can close that wound with, not have to sew it. Um, and slug slime has inspired scientists to come up with a way to do that, which is really quite fantastic. And then also something that I do um, at the museum is this is this is a gloved hand holding a snail and that's its foot and the, the, the snail is like pulling in its foot. If we want to study a snail that is um, that is endangered, possibly endangered. We don't want to um, sacrifice that snail for science. We want to leave it alive so that it can go on and, and can carry on its DNA throughout its population and for generations. So one way that we can get DNA is to just rub the, um, the foot of the snail with a Q-tip and drop that into a little vial with um, a special kind of uh, alcohol called ethanol, and that will preserve the DNA. And then we can use um, various methods to extract that DNA and study it without killing the animal. So slime is also a source of DNA. Now, how do snails and slugs use slime? Here's some slug friends. There's three here and there's all of their shiny uh, slime trails. First of all, they use it for movement. So this is on a piece of glass. This is a snail sliming along a piece of glass. This is their foot, this structure here. It's sticky and slippery, which is you've made slime, you know that it can be both sticky and slippery. And that's how um, snails and slugs move. They have muscles that move along their foot and their slime is sticky and slippery. Um, this is, these are our local Southern California snails that we fed beets. So this is a, the vegetable, this is a beet, and we put them on a beet and then we allowed them to crawl over paper um, at a museum outreach event so that people could see how they move along. And so this is just an example of how they use their, their um, slime for moving. They also ask and pretty much answer a question of who are you and where are you? So if they wanna know, um, it's sort of like a dog sniffing um, a tree. They can tell what dog has been there first. And snails and slugs can do this based on the chemicals left behind in another snail or slug slime trail. They have it for protection. So this is a real, this is an actual color. The photo, this photo is real, the color is real. Um, Sometimes the brighter a color is in nature, sometimes it can mean, don't eat me, I'm full of poisons on an animal. So this snail, or excuse me, slug has um, chemicals on its body that keeps its uh, predators from eating it because they are very poisonous. And this is a sea slug that also has bright colors and advertises to its predators, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. And it has slime on its body that makes it very, what's called unpalatable, tastes terrible. To, um, to anything that would try to eat it. So remember I said snails with shells can pull themselves into the shell and that's their way of protecting themselves. Slugs can't do that. So slugs chemicals are, that keep them protected from predators are on often on the tops of their bodies, which is a really neat adaptation. They also use their slime to seal themselves up when it gets hot and dry. So if they're living in, um, if they're a terrestrial or land living species, they live out you know, where we live, um, and it gets really, really hot, they can't find another place to go and cool down. They'll close off their bodies. And this, you can sort of see this papery material here is the, um, the remnants of a little, like a, a sort of a trap door of slime that this, a dry trap door of slime that this snail used to seal itself off and stick itself um, to, a, um, let's say a wall so that it wouldn't dry out. And then finally, um, I wanted to give you a little, a little demonstration of the very coolest um, uh, example of slime that I can think of. So this is a purple bubble snail. It's called Janthina Janthina. I'm gonna do a little experiment for you. Um, it does something really neat. 
so this is a, I have it all put together already. This is a funnel, like a plastic funnel. And this is a sock, a clean, very clean, just sock. And so I've put the funnel inside the sock and I'm gonna dip it in. This is just water and soap. And we'll see if this works. And I'm gonna blow through it. Oh, okay. So I made a big, a big sort of bunch of bubbles. And what does this have to do with slug and snail slime? It's that the coolest way that snails and slugs, or at least one species, uses its slime is to make a raft. So this is an ocean living snail, and it can make a bubble raft out of its slime, and it hooks onto it and floats upside down in the water. And it puts a special chemical on these um, on its bubbles, so it doesn't make them out of soap. I made them out of soap to show you, but it makes them out of its slime and um, a material called chitin, not the animal chitin that we just learned about, but there's also a material that has the same name and it makes them less likely to pop. So if you've watched this, it's sort of popping and becoming much smaller. This snail can make its bubble raft and it can stick around for um, at least a couple days until it has to add more bubbles. So that's the very coolest example of slime that I could think of that, um, that gastropods use. So that's all I've got for you as a presentation. Um, I'm really happy to take your questions if you have any. Thanks so much. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Vendetti. That was so cool. I loved your demonstration as well. <laughs> We've had a lot of great questions come in, so I'm going to jump right into them, if that's okay with you. Um, so we had a lot of curious students, Danny, Ariana, Reese, and Karina. They were asking, how do snails and slugs actually produce the slime? Um, they have um, what are called mucus glands in their body. So they have, depending on the snail, um, they have a number of, of, just like you have a pancreas and a liver and a gallbladder and different, different organs inside your body. Um, in a snail or a slug, they also have organs that are pretty big compared to the size of the animal. So there might be a, a snail that's body is that big. They have glands that are about that big. So it's about half the length of their body. And these particular glands mix with, um, they mix chemicals into water in the animal's body and then extrude it through their foot. And that's how they make slime and use slime. Very cool. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Megan was wondering, how do snails make their shells? And Mary was curious, how long does that take? Oh, it's a great question. So snails are born with their shell. Um, I'll give you, I'll show you an example here. So this is a really big, really gorgeous big shell. This is a marine snail. Um, and so I'm just going to show you, so this little top, it's a, you've got a, yeah, come on now. Okay. The little, the very, very top of the shell, you can see it's, it's like a slight um, dark, maybe like a dark tannish color. That is the shell that this animal had when it was a baby, which is the only animals that, that, that um, have remnants of themselves as a baby on themselves as they're an adult, I think are snails. So what they do is they're born like that, which means they, they hatch out of a little capsule or an egg. This is a marine snail that happened in the ocean. Sometimes they float around with their shell on. Sometimes they crawl away with their shell on. And then <clears throat> almost immediately their shell starts to form. And then just like your skeleton forms inside your body as you're growing, their skeleton forms on the outside. So they have no bones inside their body. Their skeleton is all on the outside and it grows like this. So it grows in a spiral for their whole life until they get to some point that they die or their shells like, or their body says, I'm just done growing. This is as big as I'm going to get. That's all I've got. That's I hope that answers your question. Oh, totally. Love that. That is so well, and how long. I'm sorry, Rachel. I think um, somebody asked how long it takes. It depends yeah. on the snail. It also depends on how much they eat, right? So if you don't eat a lot and don't, don't sleep a lot or don't get a lot of exercise, right? Your body not be, might not become as tall as you might be. The snail is the same way. If there are seasons that it doesn't eat very much, it's sort of like a tree that way too. Um, it's not going to grow very much, but years that it eats a lot and it has a very healthy life, it's going to grow much more. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, curious students want to know, 
um, about color of snails and slugs. Audrey was wondering what's the most common color for snails. And Caitlin uh -huh. is curious, what's the most colorful snail or slug that you know of? Ooh, most colorful. If you think back to, there are a lot of sea, sea slugs would take the, would take the prize for that, um, that question. So if you, um, if you Google sea slug or nudibranch, um, N-U-D-I-B-R-A-N-C-H, um, those nudibranchs are a kind of sea slug. They're extremely colorful. Um, and part of it is because they're advertising to predators don't eat me. So they have, they have bright colors that say, I'm not, I'm not food. Um, so, but most snails, snails, shells and bodies can be very different colors. So you might have a shell, um, the snail that I showed, Coletia coletia, its shell is white, but it has bacteria and algae on it that make it like a grayish green. And then its body is bright yellow. So it's a hard, that's a good question. I don't think I could answer what the most common color is. Maybe brownish tan, maybe out of all snails, um, but they can be very, very diverse in color. So neat. Anna is wondering, are there any endangered species of snails or slugs? And if there are, how can we help protect them? That's such a good question. I didn't, I didn't touch on that at all. And I'm really glad that you asked. Yes, uh, yes, there's lots of endangered land snails. Land snails are one of the, if not the most endangered group of animals on earth, on earth. So um, land snails can also be introduced from their places and really, really numerous. So if you see a land snail where you live, it might be that that land snail is from somewhere else and they're doing really well wherever you live. But the, the snails that evolved in that place, um, especially if it's an island, are often um, very likely to go extinct and for a lot of reasons, habitat destruction, introduction of um, predator species, all sorts of things that, uh, that can um, decrease their populations quite quickly. So land snails and land snails on, on islands are the most endangered group of organisms on the planet. What you can do is you can do research about this. Um, you can um, make yourself aware of, of those issues. If you collect snails, um, don't collect species that are from places where they're endangered because that makes, a, um, makes people collect them and then sell them and then that becomes a problem. Um, and otherwise just look into ways that you can protect other species. So snails are sometimes not the most, what we call charismatic species that people are interested in saving because they're snails. And often people are more interested in pandas or mountain lions or things that are really cute and cuddly and beautiful and amazing. Um, and often when you protect one species, you protect a lot of other species that also live in the same habitat. So any kind of conservation efforts are going to um, protect the habitat of snails as well. That's really good to know. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see, we maybe have time for two more questions. Uh, Etta and Ariana and Camilla were curious, do you like slugs and snails and what's your favorite if you- I love, Yes, I mean, I, I, am, <laughs> I find them amazing. I find them absolutely amazing. And um, as, as organisms, they are, are strange, really strange and, and endlessly, Fascinating. So I have um, many careers worth of questions to ask as a scientist. Um, and then Rachel, what was the end of that question? Was my favorite? Yeah. Do you have a favorite? I know it's maybe hard to pick. It's, it is hard to pick. I think that, um, so there's a group of slugs, sea slugs called Sacoglossans. So S-A-C-O-G-L-O-S-S-A-N, Sacoglossan. If you Google Sacoglossan, um, they are one of my very favorite groups and my postdoc, which is like the, the research that I did after I got my PhD, I worked with um, a scientist at Cal State LA in Los Angeles and he studied Sacoglossans and put me this, they've wowed me ever since. So they're a really strange and wonderful group of sea slugs. I'll have to check that out. All right, our last question, um, Jeanette was wondering, what's the worst and best part of your job at the museum? Worst and best. Um, okay, let's see, worst, it's hard to say worst. Um, well, okay, how about, I, I'll say this, for every hour that, I, that I'm in the field, that means every hour that I am collecting specimens and I'm out in nature, which I really love to do, for every hour that I do that, I have, at least two hours back in the lab, putting those specimens, um, 
writing up all the sort of paperwork to make sure that the museum knows what we have, uh, making sure they go where they need to go in the collection, um, and then doing research on them, which is also what I love to do. So in a sense, it's the bad, I like both parts, but I guess I can't, I, if for every hour that I'm out doing all the work that I love in nature, I have to be back in the lab twice that long to do the science that I need to do. So I don't know if I would say it's the worst, pardon me, but it's, um, but it's a balance, right? I'm not, I can't be outside looking at biodiversity all day long. I have to do, a lot of the sort of nitty gritty um, uh, uh, activities of a curator, which means we have to make sure that our collections are um, kept in, uh, in in proper order when we know what we've got. So I don't know that if it's worst, sense. but <laughs> but I, I think that that would that'd probably be the best way I could answer that question. And what do you think the best part of your job is? The, oh, sorry, it? yes, I'm sorry. I meant to say the best part is is being out, be, being finding, finding organisms in, um, in the wild is, is uh, whatever they are, is really quite amazing. Like going into a tide pool is one of my absolute favorite things on earth, or even being in a forest in Los Angeles or a habitat in Los Angeles and picking through the leaf litter. So it's just like all the creepy crawlies that are in a bunch of leaves if you move those leaves away. One of my absolute favorite things um, to do. So cool. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Vendetti, for spending your afternoon with us. It's been a pleasure and we've learned so much information. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. I'm going to go ahead and close us out of our program today. We had lots of curious students on and I know we were, there were some questions that we didn't get to answer. So um, please write them down so you can do a little bit of research on your own. Um, there are some fantastic questions and I know that there's probably a lot more interest in snails and slugs that you might want to um, check out on your own. So thank you again um, to all of our friends and our students for joining us this uh, afternoon. We learned so much about the study of malacology and Dr. Vendetti's research. We'll have all the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash NHMLA. You can also give us a follow on Instagram at NHMLA and see some of the behind the scenes research collections things there as well. We thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone.